Hello, my name is Dr. Heidi Zetzer, and I am a teaching professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I want to thank you and SCP for this opportunity to give a fellows talk. I feel deeply grateful for having been selected as a fellow, and I have some more appreciations to share before I get into the actual talk. First, I would like to thank Dr. Tanya Israel for nominating me for APA fellow status. Tanya, I appreciate your support and your encouragement. I also wanna thank those who wrote letters of endorsement for me, Drs. Clara Hill and Bob Hatcher, each of whom is a hero, mentor, and now friend to me. I have more than a few heroes and here are some of the other people who've contributed to my professional development, though they may not even know it. Please take a few moments to take a look at this slide and see who they are. And here are just a few of the SCP and UCSB colleagues and students who contributed to my personal and professional growth and I am grateful for all of them. I also wanna thank members of Division 17 and 29, the Association of Psychology Training Clinics, the Society for Psychotherapy Research, and the Santa Barbara County Psychological Association for giving me leadership opportunities. And I have tremendous gratitude and great joy for my dearest friends and SCP leaders, Drs. Camille DeBell, Julia Phillips, and Elizabeth Vera. We've been attending APA as a group since about 1996. Finally, I wanna express appreciation to my family, including my spouse, Dr. Greg Ashby. Now that you can see all the contributors to my perspective on health service psychology, let's talk about how to build a better bridge to supervision competencies. Several years ago, I made a t-shirt that says, I heart supervision. And actually here it is so you can see it, voila. I love supervision because I love teaching, training and mentoring the powerfully passionate millennials and Gen Zs who comprise the current and the next generation of professional psychologists. My goal is to help them integrate their multiple intersecting identities and community memberships with their emerging professional identities. I believe that wholeness or what Dr. Tama Bryant calls coming home is a part of that developmental process. This effort is full of authenticity and goodness. Hence, it breaks my heart when I read Mike Ellis and Heidi Hutman's articles about the prevalence of inadequate and harmful supervision. Or when I read Clara Hill and Sarah Knox's papers on non-disclosure and supervision, which is often attributed to the supervisor's inattention to the power imbalance between the supervisor and the supervisees. It breaks my heart when I read Annalise Singh and Kirsten Chun's paper on QPOC supervisors and recognize the lack of BIPOC LGBTQ plus inclusion in the supervision canon. And finally, it breaks my heart when I read Brianna French and colleagues article on radical healing in communities of color. And I'm reminded of the field's collective neglect of racial trauma. In the context of all of this, I feel inspired to promote systemic change when I listen to what my students tell me about their own experiences of inadequate and harmful supervision. And I want to use this talk to share their perspectives. Here is what my students want us to know. The best supervisors are flexible, teach models of supervision, model cultural humility, attend to power dynamics, help therapists set boundaries, check in with their supervisees and clarify learning goals. The worst supervisors are rigid and use a strict application of empirically supported treatments. They invert responsibility for growth and the supervisee becomes the educator or listener for the supervisor. They tokenize or objectify the therapist. They ignore the therapist's identities. They're not attuned to their own identities or social locations. They lack cultural competence and they shame or humiliate the therapist. Given my students' experiences, I am framing this fellows talk as yet another call for action such a call was first made by Carol Fallander and has been echoed repeatedly by everyone open to her influence. We have the guidelines for supervision and health service psychology, but we lack transparency and accountability. 
we need to build a better bridge to supervision competencies. And we can do this by tailoring supervision training to our current needs. We need to make deep structural changes in how we educate and train clinical supervisors. Change the standards of accreditation to include supervision skills training by adding a practicum requirement grounded in experiential learning. Advocate with ASPPB for amending state and provincial licensing requirements to include supervision and training for psychologists. Require faculty, supervising faculty, to not only be licensed, but also to at least take the supervision CE courses required by their state licensing boards. And provide incentives to faculty and supervising psychologists for specialized training in supervision. How will we do all this without increasing workloads? Let's make radical changes in the SOAs. For example, drop or integrate the foundational DSKs, also known as the BASES courses. Update standards for APIC internships and postdocs. Recognize and reward contributions made by supervising faculties and health service professionals as part of the merit and promotion process in universities, counseling centers, and community agencies. Let's commit to making theoretical changes and fully adopt models like Owens and colleagues multicultural orientation framework, which contextualizes the process of psychotherapy and supervision. We have the expertise, we know what needs to be done. It is time to re-envision the future of clinical supervision and to ensure that our students and supervisees are supported in developing their authentic professional selves and that they get the training, experience, and confidence they need to supervise the Gen Zs and Gen Alphas who are coming along after them. Thank you.